Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Kylie Stevens from the Centre for Excellence in Rural Sexual Health. I'm here tonight with two colleagues, Siobhan, who you've heard of there on the um, treadmill, sexual uh -huh. health physician, and Bree and in Melbourne, and Bree Atwood um, is uh, in Yakandanda on her lovely property, um, and I'm sitting in Beechworth. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are all um, in our various places uh, across Australia and um, on Aboriginal land and uh, we pay our respects <coughs> now and always. And I would also um, like to very much thank Dr. Paddy Moore once again for being our clinical lead tonight. And uh, as most of you will know, we usually don't meet every two weeks, but um, mm -hmm. Our current circumstances uh, meant that uh, it was agreement two weeks ago to um, to meet sooner rather than later and um, to uh, get down to the nitty gritty about what practices have changed and to use case studies as part of that also to um, um, to, to share the um, current context. So um, over to you, Paddy. I think everyone should have the agenda. Um, and it's great. I think most people know about mute and using chat as much as possible. Um, and um, hands up in the air if um, you've got any particular questions. Um, all right, Patty, over to you. Thank you. So I'm just looking at the um, agenda, and I think the first agenda item is Carolyn, an update from 1800 My Options. Um, it's entitled The Current Rural Landscape. Really, what, what's happening? What, what's the feedback you've got for us? All right, so um, 1800 My Options, we're still uh, running our service quite well. It's functioning pretty well, even though it's slightly altered at the moment. What we're seeing across the state is increasing numbers of women still with financial hardship relating to um, COVID-19, basically, a lot of women have lost their jobs and have lost the capacity to pay for abortions in the private system in particular. High levels of distress and emotion at the moment as well, relating either to having, feeling that they need to go into a clinic or that the system is just not working. There's a lot of assumptions that the system is already overwhelmed with um, coronavirus and that they won't be able to get this service. Um, we're also seeing increased um, reports of mental health issues. A lot of women are saying that their mental health is being significantly affected to the point where it's actually impacting on their capacity to access medical services. More coercion and family violence, reproductive coercion to continue or end a pregnancy and just general family violence as well. Um, we're seeing across the board that um, our phone calls are taking longer because women are just experiencing higher levels of distress um, just across the board. Um, could, could I ask you some direct questions that I'm interested in? Yes. Are, are your numbers of requests going up? Our numbers have gone a little bit funny at the moment so those days that used to be really busy are not so busy and the days that used to be quiet we are getting smashed on the phone so in particular Friday used to be an incredibly quiet day we didn't have to have so many people answering phones but at the moment we're getting far more than we're used to not quite sure what that's about and Tuesday used to be busy and now it's quiet so um, I think um, it's coming down to the fact that women are feeling a little bit more panicked about things as far as we yeah, can tell. Would your numbers have gone up or like pretty much pretty like steady? That? Yeah, that, that's our experience too. And that's actually a message that we're looking at a way of getting that out there that, you know, we're not overwhelmed. That's I was right. wondering if you were overwhelmed. No, we are certainly not overwhelmed. We're meeting demand and the yeah. and the demand is pretty regular as to what it all it always has been. And we're also able to find services for women. So generally we would be giving a woman three options mm -hmm. of where she can go for a service. We're often giving her up to six at the moment just because some GP practices are finding it difficult to get women in. But women are not calling us back looking for someone else. They're not looking for other options afterwards. So it seems to be meeting their needs. 
that's that's really good isn't it that's really yeah yeah uh we haven't turned anyone away at all because of COVID virus um uh one of the things that we have changed is that um women have less choice over the date that we give them so sometimes we get women saying i can't do this for another two weeks can you book me in and we can only book five days ahead because otherwise it becomes elective and it get, and we can't book it so you know that's just a, a, a slight limit on choice but when, when we explain to women that it's so that we can get their case done as soon as possible um uh they seem to completely understand Mm, it's great. Well, we haven't turned anyone away in this time. Carolyn, can I ask about access to um, ultrasound, getting bloods done, things like that? It continues to be an issue for a lot of women, particularly in outer suburban areas and rural areas. They're reporting still that ultrasound is really tri tricky to get. Um, and if they don't have a local provider um, that they can talk to, in person, they are finding it really difficult to find a GP who will talk to them and organise the workup that they need. Do you have any sense of how many GPs have stopped? Stopped providing in yeah, or just... Have, yeah, have any anybody contacted you and said, I'm not doing this anymore because I'm too busy with other stuff? They've actually, any GP that has contacted us has been to reassure us that they're still functioning, which right. is fabulous. Fabulous. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it tends to be the GP practices where they're not doing this kind of SRH work. They are getting requests from women to um, book an appointment so they can organise the workup, and the women are being told this is not an urgent or essential request, so they're not going to see her. Mm. So that's that's groups that haven't been doing the the, the M top themselves. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> So that's interesting because it sounds like the pressure is on different parts of the service delivery, isn't it? In terms of scans, access to scans. But maybe, maybe you're saying that the scans were were, were always tricky for women in either suburban areas to get. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So scans across the board are very tricky to yeah. get, particularly if a woman's looking for something that's bulk filling. Yeah. Um, but women are reporting more difficulty now. So one of the things that um, our intake workers have been doing is ringing our uh, usual allies, you know, the, the bulk billing ones, um, and seeing if they're still open for business. And the feedback is, yes, nothing's changed. Mm. Them. Really it's interesting, right. isn't it? Um, Patty, um, from, you know, Wodonga, where we had a good relationship with mm. local part of the vault, now moving to... Hoppers Crossing, but we've had pretty good access to scans and they've all been bulk filled. Mm. So I was really pleased. Carolyn, I'm curious. They're being told by um, nurse practitioners or reception staff that what they're requesting is non urgent. Is that what they're reception reporting to you? Reception staff. Reception staff. So, that, so yeah. maybe. So maybe at the practitioner level, there's an understanding that services are still essential, but at that um, ancillary and support and administrative level, um, there's confusion. Is that? I think so, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Because um, I think that would be a little bit our experience too, is there's a lot of information and it changes regularly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just increasing women's anxiety. Yeah. Mm. Anybody else want to um, comment on their experience clinically at the moment or what women are reporting back? What about at CoHealth, Siobhan, if you're not too breathless to talk? Um, Madeline could probably there. tell you a little bit more about um, that. I mean, I was there yesterday and um, your volume's not very good. Is that better? Any better? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
so I was there on, um, yesterday um, and it sort of seemed business as usual, at, but half the patients we saw over the phone, but it wasn't all MTOPs, but Madeline might be able to, Madeline, can you tell us um, whether you think there's any less MTOPs going on? Um, so I don't think there's less MTOPs. Um, than normal like we're still getting calls and we're still able to accommodate everyone who wants to come in um i feel like there might be less people wanting to obviously come for other services though so the ieds like implants and that kind of thing i think people are opting more for that over the phone yeah i mean we only put in one ied yesterday which normally yeah. i do more yeah Bit of a worry, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think so. I think so. It might be a little bit of a downstream catch up. Mm. Yeah. So we've, we've argued at the hospital that uh, uh, LARC insertion remains essential, but that hasn't translated to, uh, you know, it, it means that they haven't closed our LARC insertion clinics, but our ability to get somebody. Uh, having their marina, for example, inserted under a general anaesthetic has got harder. Hmm. Well, I must say, we did our first one where we did all of it over the phone and then she came in. So we actually hadn't even met her. Yeah. She came in at the last minute and um, so she was probably with us for, I don't know, well, she was probably with me for about 20 minutes and Madeline a bit longer because she looks after them afterwards. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that, so that actually worked quite well. Good, yeah, good. Yeah. So this is Louise in Bendigo. Hi everyone. Um, in terms of our MTOPs, we're very fortunate that uh, one of our um, radiology services is very um, accommodating. Um, what we find probably is that um, for the nurse-led model, if the nurse rings, then we can skip um, any of the reception um, kind of um, gatekeeping and issues because we'll be able to confirm, um, um, you know, probable gestation. A big thing is making sure that women are over six weeks, so they're, they're having to kind of readjust that a bit. Um, in terms of IUDs, Benigo Community Health Services has consolidated all our um, services to our one site, which is out at Eagle Hawk. And so at the moment, our, um, oh, okay. our IUD clinic has been um, suspended. Um, Dr. Um, our GP who does IUDs is looking at um, um, doing them off-site um, because of probably just the um, setup. So we're not working out of the hub at the moment. So, but we will be hopefully supporting Bendigo Health with their family planning clinic because they're wanting to suspend their routine IUD clinic um, um, from their women's health service. So um, I suppose an update to follow, but at the moment we're kind of in negotiations. So what, what's the, sorry to be stupid, what's the concern about doing it at the hub? Oh, so the hub's been closed, so our central site's been oh. closed, and so we've moved to Eagle Hawk, and therefore the, um, the setup at Eagle Hawk um, is slightly different to the hub. Oh, um, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. So we haven't put any IUDs in for two weeks. Mm. And you're currently negotiating your arrangement with Bendigo Health? So we're currently um, arranging with um, our GP in her private practice to move them to her private practice um, and which hopefully will be set up next week and then what that means is that we will be able to potentially um, take some of the pressure off Bendigo Health from their family planning clinic. So yeah, so the decision to centralise all our clinical services um, occurred after we'd had some initial discussions with Bendigo Health in terms of supporting them with their EPAS clinic and their family planning clinic. Mm. Mm. So just, you know, things change every week. Mm. Anybody else? Kat? Um, yep, hi, it's Sam here from Gateway Health um, with Donga and Wang. Um, no change to our service as in yeah i think last week we had a huge week um of terminations so yeah busy as ever no issues with ultrasounds 
um, yeah, just changing processes though. We're doing uh, as much as we can over the phone, if not all over the phone. Um, probably our biggest issue is people that we see from New South Wales, um, just getting them, you know, their work up basically. Yeah. Trying to communicate with GPs, GPs aren't being that helpful. Um, and yeah, and just having to communicate, trying to get all their results because it's taking us a lot longer, we're finding. Um, just to get everything sorted and work out processes of you know how we do these things without without seeing women, but um, also really good results. We spoke to two places, Dorovich in Lavington, yeah, Lavington and Wodonga that would do um, swabs and urine collections. So now we're just doing one form. They'll do everything. Um, so yeah, just kind of minimise our contact. Yeah. Yeah, get, get, email them all the information. Um, so that they've got everything and read everything um, before our first appointment with them. So, yeah, it's still going really well, but just trying to iron out issues along the way. Mm. Great. Yeah, are Gateway still doing IUDs and implants? So, yes, um, they are. Um, there was a bit of there was a bit of difference of opinion between um, GPs between Wang and Wodonga, um, but yeah, in Wodonga the IUD clinic is still running, although a lot of women cancelled um, last week. Um, so th yeah, there's a lot of cancellations, and the implantons, um, yeah, there, there's been less, and I think they've decided just you know if people can't have depo the pill that they you know there's no other choices that they'll do the implantons and just do the phone consult for a lot of information so it's less contact time um, in the clinic with women. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, Wodonga's been really, really good. Great. What about Kathy Mack and FPV? Um, we're, uh, we're, we're actually getting a lot of calls with these tops, like we're, we're, we're sort of feeling quite overwhelmed. Um, Your volume's yeah, really low. Well. Oh, sorry. Um, is that better? No. Mm. Do you know what? I might call out and ring in on, on my computer. I'm just on my phone at the moment. So keep going yeah. and I'll come back in. Okay. Yvonne, how are you going up there? <sighs> Good, thanks, Patty. Whoops, can you hear me? Yes, really well. <laughs> yes, I'm <bad. laughs> Um, Yes, so we haven't really been doing many Ebon Tops at Madras, but I just wanted to keep... Um, in contact with the network. Um, I, I watched the recording of the last presentation, mm -hmm. the last meeting, which was very helpful to know what's going on in the area if we do get any women looking for MTOP in the, these situations of COVID. Yeah. And look, the other thing maybe to, to reassure you about is that when, if, if and when there's someone who's beyond that gestational age, um, and you can't find a local user because I know there are situ the situations a bit tricky up mm -hmm. there to by all means give us a call. Yes, because that's great. And I sent with an expectation that we will have to step up a little bit more for rural and remote. And I sent that up to my colleagues in Mildura too, in case yeah. they have any problems. Yeah, up yeah. There. Let yeah. them know that you girls are happy to be contacted. Anytime. Thank you very much. And um, while we're waiting for Kathy Mack to ring back in, um, what have we changed? I was mentioning before that we are, uh, we're still trying to put in as many, if not more IUDs as possible. So we, we've converted all of our, um, um, any telephone, any, anything we can do on the phone, we have converted to the phone. So we've converted um, all of our, any follow-ups that we'd be doing or any uh, consult in general, somebody with say cardiac problems trying to decide which form of contraception. Um, but you know, that, that has got simpler in years, in the last few years. So there's fewer of those. So we, we do do most of those kind of consults on the phone now. And Kath and another consultant are working on extending our telehealth model for even um, urban uh, women who aren't, who aren't able to get a service. So they're working on that really um, busily. Um, and the other thing is that we have tried to move, uh, so we've got this idea, a COVID strategy is like, if you're gonna to have to come to a hospital, come once, because a hospital is not a good place to be. Um, you bump into more people here than you do at the supermarket. So any 
interaction we have, we're trying to make it a once only. So even though our gestational age has increased as other services are doing more, we're trying to do 90% of our surgical cases as um, same day service. And at the same time, increasing our proportion of MTOPs. So we'll extend the MTOP maybe to the 10th week and we will um, try and see more or encourage women to, uh, you know, to look at MTOP as a viable alternative. Because one of the other things is that um, uh, the risk factor of having a intubation episode of care if you are uh, an asympt in your asymptomatic um, COVID-19 phase means that your outcome for that episode of COVID could be much, much worse, plus the um, risk of infecting all the theatre staff. And also theatre cases are taking approximately half as long again to complete because of the um, barrier protection that we have to use. Yeah. Yeah. So our capacity hasn't decreased because we've increased the number of lists. So we're still able to see the same number of women and do the same number of surgeries, but it's taking more lists to achieve that. <clears throat> um, and the same day service for even patients up to 20 weeks. So it's that group 20 to 24 that will have to have a two day procedure. But again, we're trying to do as much of that on the phone and our intake workers are doing the vast majority of the psychosocial assessment and options mm. assessment on the phone. So we're sort of trying to work lean and it seems to be working well. Oh, Kathy's here. Have you rung in again, Kathy? Um, yes, we're, we're actually being, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, good, good. good. Um, we're, we're actually being overrun with calls for MTOPs at the moment and, and we are finding ultrasounds, bulk build ultrasounds a bit difficult to get because they're coming from all over the place. We don't have that relationship with the provider. And um, we're, doing, we're doing it all telehealth at the moment. Um, we're not actually often not seeing them at all. Um, one thing that does concern me is with the, the change to the um, telehealth items that you have to bulk bill pregnant women, um, if you use telehealth, whether that could end up making it more expensive for women to access abortion if people aren't bulk billing for it, just a thought. Uh, so can you explain that? I didn't follow that. So, so with the telehealth items, they've just noticed, uh, announced that you can private bill um, for them. Like when they came in initially, you had to bulk bill. Um, but there are exceptions like um, children under 16, healthcare card holders and pregnant women are included in that. And bulk billing. Sorry? As bulk billing. Bulk billing, yeah. And I yeah. suppose it just concerned me that it might have an impact on increasing costs for them um, if, if people were using a private model for, the, um, for, for uh, medical termination of pregnancy and if they, they, they couldn't bulk bill the phone consultation, you know, so, so, so the woman would actually end up getting a higher cost. Does that make sense? Are you bulk billing? We're bulk billing, yes, yes. Hmm. And I then, think it's crazy what they've done is, you know, they've announced these you know, bulk billing telehealth item numbers. Everyone's been advertised that it's bulk billing. Yes. And GP, privately billing GPs are suddenly realising their income per consultation is going to be halved. Yeah. Hmm. And so obviously there's been a ruckus behind the scenes. And so now they've come and said, oh, actually you can private bill them. Yeah. But I think it's going to be very hard to implement because people... You know, it's been very widely promoted as being bulk build and free. So, yeah. I mean, I, I I don't think a phone consultation is as good as um face to face, and I don't think you have the right to charge a private fee for it. I, you know. Yeah, I I just worry whether that's actually going to happen. Yeah, I agree entirely, Kathy. I think it's a really yeah. good point. Mm. So, what are you doing, Kath, if you can't get a scan? Um. Well. Um. Oh, look, I ended up doing one without a scan because we just couldn't get an option to get a scan and she had it gave a really good history. Um, and we had one for a follow-up who we really would have liked to scan for, but in the end her symptoms went and her HCG went down, so it was okay. But I'm thinking I'll be calling, possibly calling you if we run into a lot of trouble. But <laughs> Um, so that might, has anyone else got anything they wanted to share? Because I was just thinking, 
Kathy's comment segues nicely into the clinical presentation about follow-up care and not scanning and thinking of other ways of managing people. Mm -hmm. So has anyone else got anything they wanted to share about what's happening in their area? Oh, we had two things. Oh, sorry. Well, should we just share about Ballarat's good story? Yeah. Yeah. So look, this is further uh, evidence that things are maybe not as crises as people are portraying in the media, you know? So uh, Ballarat had an issue where they were transferring their surgery to St. John of God. So I'll let you fill in the connection there. So if all surgery was happening at St. John of God, there would be none of our kind of work done. And so Natasha Frawley, who's a colleague of ours and a great ally, was very concerned that that would mean that they would um, call abortion elective surgery and close it down. And so she was very concerned. So we had a, a bit of a, an email conversation and um, two things happened. The local member for Ballarat spoke to Jenny Makakos and we were able to give Natasha the college guidelines and the Royal Australasian and New Zealand college guideline that abortion care is an essential service and must keep going. So she put pressure on internally and Jenny Makakos sent the memo externally and the service is back on. So that's, cool. that's really a good example of, you know, a teamwork. Hmm. Um, I know that um, the marvelous Mark Faruja, as I like to refer to him, has got a little bit of a problem because the partner that he works with and does lists with, he just sent an email on Sunday, she's in isolation because she um, was in contact with a COVID-19 mm. patient. And so they're gonna have some problems with some of their surgical patients. But at the end of the email conversation, uh, he also works at Geelong and Geelong has said that he could bring the patients to Geelong. Mm. So and not as convenient for the woman, but if he's, if he's not on call that week, um, he can bring them down to Geelong. Mm. So there, there, there are some issues, but yet again, all you marvellous clinicians are thinking of ways around it. So I think that's a very nice little roundup to mm. feedback. Mm. Yeah. So should we go on to the case? Has everybody got a copy of the case? Where's your copy, Siobhan? <laughs> Shall I read it? Because you're going to be walking, you're not going to be able to read it. Yeah, that might be my fault, because I think the case we sent out at last meeting, but I don't know that I sent it out with the agenda for this meeting, Patty. So apologies, just... but if you could read it out, that'd be fab. The lesson for today, okay? So this is Mrs. Um, Ms. Ms. C19, and she's mm -hmm. age 26, and she's gravitated to para one. She's had a normal delivery of a five-year-old. And uh, on consultation date, day one, she's certain in her decision for a medical abortion. Let's say you're doing it on telemedicine or something. She had an ultrasound, and the ultrasound, uh, on the day of the ultrasound, she was six weeks plus two, a singleton intrauterine pregnancy, there was a yolk sac, there was a crying rump, and there was a fetal heart positive. So this is a definite intrauterine pregnancy. She had swabs taken, and uh, they were all negative. Her beta HCG was taken, you didn't know it on the day of the concert, but it later returned at 20,000, so 20,000, 20,000. Um, her contraception is a plan for Marina at the follow-up visit, and you were planning to see her in the clinic some two weeks after the MTOP. She's really keen to proceed with a medical abortion, and she otherwise meets the criteria. So um, the issue with her is that it suits her to take her mifepristone on day one and her misoprostol on day two rather than waiting the two days because she wants to do it all over the weekend uh, her partner's a shift worker this is what's going to work for them someone's going to look after the, the child so she takes mifepristone on day one on day two she takes misoprostol and the agreed plan was to return on day 14 for follow-up so up to this point this is all very standard would everybody agree with that 
Um, and it's not unusual to allow people to um, deviate a little bit from the 48 hours. Unless anybody wants to comment on that, has anyone had any experience on any uh, anything unusual happening if they do that? No, everybody's okay with that. Yeah, we're we're doing more of that really than than we used to. We used to be really stickler for the 48 hours, and we're doing more and more of the 24, particularly if they're early gestation. Everybody's nodding. Yeah. Okay, so the events of the procedure. On the second day, she had heavy bleeding within two hours of the misoprostol, and the patient really felt that she'd passed it all very quickly into the toilet. She didn't see a sack or anything, but she had an episode of ex um, escalating pain. She sat on the toilet and then her bleeding stopped. Again, would people feel that this was pretty normal? Yep, a lot of people don't see their products. Um, and so um, on day five, phone call from the clinic, which would be a, quite an average length of time that we'd contact people, yeah. So on day five, she's recovering well. She's bit of, got a bit of ongoing PV loss and we would reassure her, yeah, that that's pretty normal. Um, now on day 14, uh, her follow-up, she's had her beta HCG and it's 5,000. She reports feeling well with ongoing PV loss, which increases a little bit when she goes jogging. Uh, she's a, she doesn't have a temperature and her, her blood doesn't smell unusual. Does anybody want to make any comment about that? Either about her symptoms or the beta? What do people think about the beta? Sam, what do you reckon about that beta? You're mute, love. <laughs> I'm trying to work out in my head. Is that is that eighty percent drop? No. Good. Yep. What are we doing? Twenty thousand. From twenty thousand to five thousand. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, it's still the beta is still very high. So in our clinic, when the beta is still that high, we would actually um, follow up with her. We would do an, would do another beta. In when a few would you do, when would you do your next beta? Um, I think I think we'd do it in depends on the doctor, but I think if if the person's well, like within that next week, and if the person remains well, they're you know asymptomatic, as in no temperature, no odor, um, with their loss or anything, and they're feeling well, that we would probably leave it a week, and so just monitor. Any, um, any yeah, 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 sure, sure. And there's nothing wrong with that answer. And there, there aren't any wrong answers here. I'm just interested in what people would do. Um, and then later on, there might be a little bit of guidance. So what would others do at 5,000? She feels well, but a brownish loss. Kathy, what would you suggest? Um, it's, was the 20,000 on the day of the, the mythopristone or, or not? Uh, it was the day before, Kathy. Day before, yeah, okay. I mean, it's not, it's a 75% drop, which is sort of near enough. Um, so, yeah, I think I'd do similarly, provided yeah. that she was well and she was happy with, with what mm -hmm. we said and, you know, had all the usual stuff about going into hospital. Yeah, we'd just see how she goes and repeat the beta in about a week. Any other comments? So, yeah. if I, sorry? Mm -hmm. So, would anybody use routine antibiotics in this case? Mm -hmm. Well, so we were surprised that she was given two weeks of oral antibiotics. So I guess the thought is that the bleeding is an infection. So uh, in spite of her having swab negative, being afebrile and having no symptoms of infection. So this was just a learning point me banging the table there's no need for antibiotics if there's no evidence of infection and it's not necessarily going to fix bleeding so uh are any of you trialing it for ongoing annoying bleeding without any evidence of infection i think this is an example that there are a huge number of varieties of things 
that people are, are, are doing when people come for follow-up. I was just going to say also that the other thing is it's just day 14 there. Mm, mm. And so, you know, the, if the average time of bleeding is 16 days mm. following an MTOP, she's still within yeah. the range, isn't she? Yeah. I think yes. yes. Hi, Liz. Who are you, Liz? Love to know who you are. Um, I'm Liz Kennedy. I'm up in um, Mount Isa. Hi, Liz. Hi, Liz. Hi. Liz. 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 Hi. And God knows how to turn the video on, but it dropped out all weekend when I was doing zoom so it just won't go on look it's just great to hear your voice liz and are you uh are you keeping up with the conversation anything yeah. you want to add no it's good we're um a sexual health unit and yeah. we started doing um m tops last year and we've probably had a few less in the last month i suppose compared to um mm. what we had had um but we're really lucky that we've got we don't have um we're a nurse-led clinic and we telehealth to our doctors Arun Menon over in Townsville. Wow. So, you, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. look, we're yeah. just really impressed. Yeah, I um, think, um, sorry, can we just stop until we work out who those other two people are? Yeah, I agree. Can we? Uh, otherwise, we're just, we could have anybody in. We'll get room. back to sorry. Liz. So sorry, who, Liz. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, Kylie, can you, can you, can you either ask them directly who they are or can you stop them? Can you block them, turn them off? Uh, the Lenovo person is Michelle Chapman. I'm sitting here at home in Dead. Oh, okay. So when you talk, I think you must be coming in through a Lenovo tablet and your phone number. Exactly. Okay. I can't get the sound on the Lenovo and right. so I'm using the phone as well. Okay. Thank you. Hi, hi Michelle. See you on. Is that Michelle Simpleton? Chapman. Chapman. Hi, Michelle. So Chapman. Much. I know you. Hi. Thank you. Where, where Hi. Are you from, Michelle? Um, I've just finished at Madaz Muldura and I'm about to start at F Dayton Primary Health across the river in New South Wales. Oh, look, it's really nice to hear from you. And look, we're sorry we're being in, uh, intrusive and in asking who everybody is, but otherwise we wouldn't have been able to welcome you. Yeah. So, do we know who Wallace is? Yeah, that's Suzanne. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, shall we press on? Anybody else who uh, wanted to make a comment on routine use of antibiotics? I think I think it's very common. We see it a lot through the emergency department. People just being put on antibiotics. And if you give an antibiotic, you assume you've got an infection. Would the group agree that we could probably at day 14 sit on this? Yeah. Would anybody advocate a scan? Good. Not in your presence, Patty. <laughs> yeah. I know the lesson is going to be scan you not. <laughs> so at this stage, we wouldn't scan. She's jogging. So she must be well you know <clears throat> um so day 21 you have contact with her again she's still got pb loss as before and this time she's fed up with it so this is a common scenario she's tired she's worried that she's becoming anemic and she's very upset and what she says is i want it all over and would people like to comment on this as a, an, an interaction? Is this is something, a common thing that you might hear from some of your patients? Um, it's, it's not, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's common from us. Mm -hmm. um, if, if someone rang, rang back and if they had the same amount of bleeding, but by then we'd expect it to be spotting. So we'd expect it to be lighter by day 21. Mm -hmm. um, we would probably like, and depends on if we'd probably just keep monitoring them and, and giving them reassurance. Once again, asking all those same questions. Is there any odour? You know, ask, ask them about the loss and what that actually means. Um, do they think it's increased, decreased? Is it the same? Um, you know, the colour and um, probably just get more information just to assure them. Because we say people can have spotting up to 30 days. Some people mm. spot into their next period. So... If I guess, if they were really anxious um, and, you know, and, and yeah, we're, we're not consolable, but we may, you know, the doctor may consider giving them a scan um, 
really just to make sure that there's nothing going on. But there's nothing to suggest at this stage that, you know, if she's got, if she's still got light loss and it's the same, you know, no odour and she's still well, that we, we wouldn't, we'd just still monitor. Mm -hmm. Would anybody like to comment, would anyone do a beta HCG? You could. We could. Yeah. We well, sometimes do do that. That's a bit easier to get hold of, yeah. And just also um, contributing from Suzanne has just said that she would as well because Suzanne can't um, verbally, so she's just put it on chat. Oh, yeah, repeat beta chat. Okay, so what have I said? The repeat beta came at back as 2,500. You could just do a thumbs up if you're okay with that and a thumbs down if you're not. It sounds more reassuring, doesn't it? It keeps dropping. Yeah, it's dropping. Yeah, yeah. So if if it was dropping as well, Sam and um, it sounds like Suzanne the same, you'd be more reassuring of the patient. Yeah. Um, okay. Are there are there any other things we could do for her bleeding at this point if she wanted to get rid of her bleeding? Well, I've heard you say use cyclocapron. I've never used it myself. You suggested it for a patient that we had who mm -hmm. just continued to bleed. Mm. So um, for just a bit of bleeding uh, after her jogging or... Should we check and see what her haemoglobin is? Yeah. Mm. I you mean... If we're I, doing I, a beta, you could check her haemoglobin, couldn't you? Mm. Yeah. So I was, that's, it was just what I was thinking there. Like if we're at the point of really wanting to reassure the patient without doing a scan, when you're doing the beta, you could do an HB, yeah? So if it was 125, it's spotting. You know, isn't it? It's minimal. But if it was 86, we might be really concerned that there's, you know, um, vascular products left behind. So it might be useful to use a hemoglobin there. And you don't have to have had one prior, I don't think. Any comments on that? You don't have to have had a recent haemoglobin to check it. So, um, can I just say, Patty, there's another um, question here from Suzanne. Would you be concerned about retained products at this time? So, no is the answer from me that if it's dropping that quickly, there may be a little bit of retained products, but what? what we're concerned about is what's the patho pathological potential of retained products at this stage. So there might be a little bit of something there, Suzanne, but um, uh, she's not bleeding heavily and her beta's going fine yeah? and her haemoglobin's okay. If we do do a scan, and this is the, the report that we got in this case, so we didn't do the scan, someone else did the scan and sent the patient in for an urgent curette. So this is the scan report. And of all of the complications we're seeing, about 85% of them have a scan report almost identical to this one, okay? So it says, it's an antiverted uterus, seven by four by three centimeters, the endometrial thickness is 10 millimetres. Normal or abnormal? Normal. It's normal. Yep. With a small amount of echogenic material seen near the fundus. This measures 14 by 18 by 12 millimetres. In brackets, 2.5 mils and has evidence of vascular flow. This could represent retain products of conception, a uterine polyp, or retained blood. So that's the kind of result you get, Suzanne, when you do a scan and you've got a well patient. Um, so this patient was sent in acutely for um, a urgent curette and told by her GP that, you know, she could have really serious sequelae. So it's just that, that's that, that um, uh, lesson that I, I quite like to sort of tease out with everybody, chase her symptoms, not the scan result, yeah? Um, and then my next, so is everybody kind of in agreement with that, that they wouldn't jump on that scan result? And that's because we've all got a bit more experience. And this is one of the things that we're, we're talking about, trying to support the GPs who maybe do four a month, and are, are worried about it. Um, 
is what to do next. Does she need a DNC? What what would the pros and cons of a DNC be? Mm -hmm. She's been sent in for one, and so now I'm, I'm up, my registrar is about to see her to talk about it. Any comments? Louise, what would you suggest? You say Louise? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I probably would not um, necessarily, so as a nurse practitioner, I probably would not necessarily refer for a DNC. What would you suggest? Um, so, potentially at this time, because we are still well, but she's still bleeding, do we look at, um, is it possible to give more misoprostol or is it possible just to monitor? Mm -hmm. I'm putting it out there. Yeah. So, um, any other comments about pros and cons of doing a curette versus medical? Well, one of the one of the cons of doing a um, curette in this day and age with COVID is that you're exposing her yeah. and and you guys, <laughs> not me, um, to increased infection. Yeah. So I think that's it. It, it. Like I wouldn't be doing it when we didn't have COVID, but um, I would really not want to, I would want to be trying to be more conservative in management. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I think that I would agree with you that we'd always be trying to say be more conservative um, and no particularly you don't want to expose people so if we're thinking of the pros for some women they really want closure they want it over they want an end to it versus uh, exposing people to an un unnecessary anesthetic but the other, the other side of it is, and it's something that's not discussed very often, is that repeat curettes or a curette after uh, a, um, a miscarriage when it's not really necessary is much more likely to cause Asherman syndrome. Mm -hmm. And the fertility specialists, it's still a rare thing, but we're, we're, we're talking now more and more about consenting people for the effect on their cervix of repeat curettes. And this woman may have had curettes in the past, this woman hasn't, but people do. And then um, in, in the situation of having a very small amount of products, the curette is less curative and it's more likely to cause a problem. So that's where I'm kind of coming from. Um, and in the time of COVID, is that a way of calling it in the time of COVID? Mm -hmm. Care in the time of COVID, we'd be really trying to decrease the number of episodes. So to answer the question about was there uh, was there any uh, was there any uh, benefit to be gained from using another dose of miso? That's that's a common one at this point. Anybody care to comment about that? Um, I've just had so little success with yeah. miso. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I sort of feel quite reluctant to use it. Yeah, because all it's going to do is open the cervix again and cause more bleeding. Mm -hmm. So she's got this little bit of vascular flow. So um, anybody else used any little, any tricks of the trade for this? Catherine, have you got any tricks? Can you use norethisterone? Yeah, you can. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can. So there, and um, so you could try to give her a break because she hasn't. Uh, had that episode in her cycle yet where she's got increased progesterone. So you could use norethisterone, which then brings up, so that might help the bleeding um, and stabilize the endometrium. Is there any other way of stabilizing the endometrium? The pill? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because there's a glaringly obvious issue here that she hasn't had her marina inserted. Could you insert her marina? Well, I was just thinking that that's what I would be doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I so, hope that's okay. Yeah, no, no, I would be doing that, uh, yeah. particularly in the time of COVID. That yeah. there's a there's a little bit of a feeling that you have to wait till the uterus is empty before you can you put in the um, marina. And if I could just talk for a minute, as the experience as a surgeon is that the uterus is never quite empty at the end of an abortion because as soon as you stop rubbing up the uterus a clot forms and we still put the marina in mm. so this is sort of 
an example of there's a tiny little bit left over from a physiological miscarriage, you could, if the beta HCG is on the way down, you could probably put the marina in quite safely. Or as Kathy suggests, use the pill. Yeah? Because I'm concerned about her, I'm starting to get concerned about her uh, contraception at this point as well. What's the other advantage of the pill? Kathy's waving, yeah. Oh, sorry, I wasn't going to talk about the advantage of the pill, but I was going to um, talk about, uh, we've just had a few more IUDs fall out than we would have expected if they're still bleeding. Um, you know, not if it's a little bit of bleeding, um, but, um, you know, if they're still sort of having it passing the odd clot, we tend to put it off until it's settled. It's not scientific, but that's what we've noticed. Mm. Patty, is there a kind of um, volume of product in the uterus that can be safely be ignored as long yes. as it's yeah. well? Basically anything under 25 by 25 by 25. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is so much less than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's 25 by 25 by 25 three months later and she's still bleeding. And then it's probably calcified or something. Mm -hmm. I remember at Gateway we had a similar patient and she, there was, um, I think she fell under that sort of um, rule, that mm. guidance for the volume and she didn't want a DNC and she was adamant yeah. to not having it and it actually took two periods but it actually all just gradually cleared. Settled down, yeah. yeah. And she, she remained well and had no offensive discharge. So I, I always tell patients you might, you may well bleed until your next period. So yeah, yeah. I always tell them that because I think they have that expectation then that it's not and they put up with it for the month. They have a period. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So again, the, the message I'm just trying to get across is particularly now let's focus on dealing with the patient's symptoms that are bothering that patient. So your patient who wanted to avoid a curette could handle the bleeding because she really didn't want to have a curette. Um, other patients are really disturbed by the bleeding because it means that that to them the, emo the emotional episode of having the abortion hasn't finished yet and so maybe starting the pill earlier with a beta HCG of 2500 um, or, or less is, is also an adequate response because she can start getting some endometrial stabilization. Mm -hmm. So if I was thinking about using northisterone I'd be thinking about using it in combination with estrogens at a dose that would be contraceptive. I think it's a good argument for doing your follow-up HCG early, like at a week, yeah. because you've got then that, like I saw a woman today who, someone else in my, in Utopia done their, their MTOC, and I saw her for follow-up because she was febrile, and we were 10 days later and had no follow-up HCG. I mean, she was febrile, so that was quite different, but. I think if you've, if you've got that 80% drop on the HCG, you've really got some good argument to say, you know, this is not significant products. So mm. I'm, I'm a real advocate of the one week post. Do one at the time of the Mifepristone and then do one one week later. Yeah, so um, just aware of the time. So I think we've, we've teased out quite a few things. One of the other things to, to suggest is that we're now starting to access the slightly expensive, but um, in, in our clinic, we're going to fund it for our patients, the low sensitivity beta HCG. So they would get it at two weeks. And if it's, if it's negative, again, that's really reassuring. Yeah. Um, so I'm aware that like it's seven and Kath was going to talk very briefly. I think we've covered Kylie, I'm sorry, we've jumped to some of the other, when we did our round robin, we've actually dealt with meeting participants having an opportunity to share. So I think we've done that, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so, fine, um, that's fine, Patty. There's just one outstanding question, if you Kathy, don't mind me, bring it up from uh, Steph. Then, In the well, time of COVID, would you prefer oral contraceptive to Mirena? No reason. Uh, I can't think of one. Can anybody? Are you thinking more that it's because uh, it would be an episode of care and they'd have to come in for it? 
I'm just sort of thinking like the average length of time of the script is six months and, you know, they're going to still need contraception. They might, I think the, the, the advantages of LARC carry on, you know, like from one episode, you see her once and then five years time, it's pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so not necessarily. Um, I think, um, sorry, Caddy, I think it was just something that we'd said in our last meeting about um, a number of people saying they were concerned that um, their people might be lost to follow up in this particular period and they may well be prescribing OCP more consistently for that reason. So I guess yeah. I was just thinking around that conversation. I think, I think and I never want to be uh, construed that, you know, it's like above all else. And for, some, for many yeah. women, um, COCP is the right choice and it's going to be ideal and it's going to be a good stopgap. But I think the, the, the key is to give the, don't deny an option that might be really useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so Kath Hannon was just going to talk, sorry Kath, yeah, you're right. about professional development. Hmm. So this was really an opportunity to make sure that everyone knew about the meeting, uh, our second meeting um, to bring together service providers from around the state, abortion and uh, contraception service providers as an opportunity to monitor the impact of COVID-19 and what's changing in the service system. And, you know, we, oh, we talked earlier about, you know, increased access or a difficulty accessing scans and the level of fear and anxiety in the community. So we had our first meeting last week and we've got another meeting tomorrow. Um, and it's a very practical, uh, opportunity to update um, uh, update uh, other services and around what's happening in your own service system and also uh, with representation from DHHS so it's a good opportunity to feed directly back to them uh, around what's going on with in your service delivery and the opportunity for, to do some advocacy and um, support for different models of service delivery. And also, people, and I think we've mentioned this previously, that Rands Cog has just recently put out um, that for, for women who are accessing a medical abortion to forego the need for anti-D as an opportunity to, um, uh, you know, n not to have to go, have to not to have, have contact with another health service. And that's a follow-up from a lot of evidence-based guidelines um, across the world. So it's it's not an ill ill-conceived, excuse the pun, uh, idea. Um, and I just want to put out there if you're not going to treat somebody's um, blood group, do you need to find out what it is? Mm. So it's one less thing, isn't it? You know, so um, if you had a scan, maybe you don't have to do the first beta HCG and maybe we'll, we might move to no beta to begin with and just urine follow-ups. Mm. Yeah. So, and and yeah. I would have to add that you would need to be thinking about their STI screening though. You what? Say that again. You'd need to be thinking about their STI screening yeah. for their syphilis. The urine? No, 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 for her, for her, um, her syphilis, so from the blood. Oh, right, the blood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, I know it sounds like you could you almost. Just my fun. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you're right. No, you're right. So, tell, tell everybody about syphilis. Do we have to screen everybody for syphilis? Yes. 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 Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so everybody yes. would do, everybody gets a syphilis and a HIV now. Yeah. So, therefore, they're going to have a blood test so you could do the yeah. beta. And I know we have sort of put it out there in one of the search newsletters that um, if you weren't doing it, we should actually um, be putting them on a list and following them up for their STI screening. In, so what do you mean putting so, them on a list? Well, just put them on a list so that you can actually screen them the next time you see them um, post-COVID when when you are doing blood tests for something else or we are able to see people face to face. If you forgo it, remind yourself that yeah. you need to do 
it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you did, you know, if it was forgotten, do you go back and do it again, or do you just put them on a list and the next time, which works or can work in community health, probably wouldn't work so much for you guys in the hospital, hospital. when you wouldn't mm. be seeing them again and again. Mm. But um, it's worth, and that we've also sort of thought about that for cervical screening as well. Okay. So, so that you'd follow up and abnormal, but if someone was just through their regular. Yeah. You know, so. so look, I really stand corrected and humbled, um, Siobhan. <laughs> no, really, because I was thinking, let's get rid of it all. Let's just get rid of all blood tests. <laughs> we don't even have to see them, and you know, yeah, um, yeah. yeah but yeah, that's a bummer because. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, my daughter asked me a question last night without notice. She said, "Do you expect the incidence of STI to decrease in the time of COVID?" Mm. And I said I'd ask the experts tonight. I, at Paran, we're seeing lots of men who would normally be coming in for prep saying, I don't need it at the moment. Because I wonder if that'll change over time. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I get the feeling that STI rates will go down. I think up here they might go up. <laughs> Did, you say up here? Did you say up there they might go up? Yeah. Yes, I think um, in in Queensland, up in the northwest of Queensland, I think unfortunately they might go up. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of thinking that they will go down in the people that we normally think about them going down in, but I, I think there might be some sort of rebound after a while. Mm. People sneaking out and they're not admitting to anybody, mm. or you know, the other thing that worries me is the. Um, sort of statement that if you've got a relationship that you're not living with bloody blah, blah that you can go and see them and I think that might be cause for a lot of relationships <laughs> starting yeah. you know so that people will, uh, the definition because there's no definition of relationship apart That's from they're just saying live with or don't live with I think Whereas, it's got something to do with how many texts she receive in a day <laughs> <laughs> Keep walking, Dal. But yeah. look, um, I just wanted to end on that as a possible research paper for us that you know could could STI rates be a retrospective guide to how good social distancing actually was? You know how they talk about whether it's a 70% or an 80% uh, social isolation model. Could the what? STI rates be a, uh, a surrogate marker of how well a society's done? It was um, a, a paper done years ago, which like I'm talking 30 whatever years ago, that showed when they introduced television to one particular city in India, the STI rates went down. <laughs> Because if you can watch TV, you don't have to have sex. Uh -huh. I've always said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other comments? Kathy, were you going to say something? Sure, Kit fairly has got about 27 papers that he's got coming out about um, <laughs> the, the STI rates and COVID. Yeah, maybe we should do our own one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, everyone, look, it's been really Thank interesting. Thank you very much. That was great. Yeah. Oh, can, I, can I just ask one question? Because I've missed something along the line. How long have we been screening for syphilis and HIV for everyone having a termination? I was going to ask the same question. Yeah, we are. Uh, it's, <laughs> um, it's around pregnant people. The guidelines are that every pregnant person, by definition, they've had unprotected sex because they've got pregnant, and therefore they should actually be screened for syphilis and HIV. Okay. Yeah, that it depends if they're like we used to see large numbers of women that were in a long-term relate, you know, monogamous relationship. So we wouldn't even screen them for any ST. Why? Mm -hmm. um, would you agree, Sam? Uh, we'd still do the. Um, I, well, I don't know. We'd still do the chlamydia and gonorrhea. If you're going to do that, why would you not do the yeah. others? I mean, the HIV is probably more debatable than the syphilis now that we've had a rise in syphilis and there's been a rise in congenital syphilis, which is a concern. So um, that it was really, the syphilis was really added in last year, but the HIV has actually been there for quite some time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's a <laughs> good idea. I love syphilis. You should test, 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 test. Yeah. Come, come up here then. <laughs> 
<laughs> Can I just ask, um, so these meetings uh, up until this point of time have been quarterly, but now in the world of COVID-19 and sexual health, we've had one now in um, two in the last two weeks. What would you like to do from now as a network? Do you want to have them more frequently or revert back to quarterly? So the next meeting is when, Carly? I haven't got that at my fingertips. It's still at least two months away. I wonder if there's somehow we could I'm chat. Like, do you want me to put it in the, in the evaluation? Say that again, Bray. I could put it in the evaluation. Yeah, good idea. I was just thinking, Kylie, that we've got the, the other meeting that was two weeks ago was an advocacy meeting. It wasn't actually this meeting. Not clinical. It's not clinically based, the advocacy one. Like if there was stuff that came from this meeting where people clearly needed some advocacy around a particular part of the clinical practice, then that would be the job of that group. But this one really is about, you know, the clinical care. Mm. So my, uh, Bre Bree's just suggested that put it in the evaluation if people feel like we need um, a, a, another meeting in between. 2nd of June is the next one that's actually scheduled. So it seems, it seems about right to me, but we could, like if things really change and then yeah. there's a total shutdown and there's no ultrasounds, mm. let's convene, you know, and come up with a, a mm. scheme, yeah? Thanks so much. It's very easy to get hold of search and send out a message to everyone, isn't it? Yeah, that's but fine by us. We're, we're happy to be responsive to the need and um, we can go and from people, there. That's a good idea for yours, Kath. If people want to put in, in their evaluation of tonight, no, I want a two weekly, that would be great. Yeah. To tell us, just tell us. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll send it out yep. tomorrow. Okay, fantastic. Bye, everyone. Keep up the great work. Bye, everyone. Thanks. That was really good. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, everyone.